Okay, so it seems there was a little problem at Instagram, but it, uh, hopefully um, it's resolved. So we're going to do this uh, live again from the start. Que vayan a ver de José Miguel. So um, just very briefly, an intro introduction to, um, to these live sessions. We're doing them every day, 5 p.m. And the idea is that we invite um, an interesting guest um, that works with um, a topic related to sustainability. The topics are very broad. Earlier this week, on Monday, um, Sayuras had a talk with um, Raquel from Cero Plast, talking about how we can reduce the use of plastic in our daily lives. Um, yesterday, we had a very interesting conversation with Ginny Heinsen, um, talking about uh, social responsibility. And so, um, today, we're going to be talking about how we can manage organic wastes uh, at home with a focus on vermicompost or worm composting. As you can see, we're going to be doing this in English today. Um, for two reasons. Um, one is that it comes a lot more organic to me and I think um, the, the conversation will be more fluent this way. But also, um, we've had requests even from elsewhere in, in New York and the States and Europe of people that were also curious that wanted to join. So we decided to just mix it up and have chats um, in Spanish and others in English. So today's talk will be in English. We'll focus on vermicompost. And our um, guest is Jake Keel. Some of you may know him already. Super interesting guy. Um, sustainability innovator, thought leader, and he's also produced an award-winning documentary. So let me see if I can invite Jake and uh, we get this conversation started. There we go. All right. Round two. <laughs> We're back. Well, it seems there was a major malfunction at uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook. I guess it's all owned by Facebook anyway, right? So initially I was like, what's going on? You know, like, is it my phone? Is it my internet? And then... Other people were like, oh, no, 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 there's something bigger going on. So anyway, it was not us. It, was, it wasn't our devices. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Facebook, so it, it, it does mean that we'll... Uh, yeah. Everything is going down. It's the end of the world. Bring in the worms. <laughs> exactly. They're afraid of hearing the truth about worms. I know. I know. They're trying to censor us, but it's, it's not happening. We got, we got some worm power here. All right, so I already gave a brief introduction to everyone. Hello, everyone, um, um, about the topic of today's conversation. I gave a very brief introduction who you are, but I think it can be nice to, uh, to just give a very short intro, which is going to do it from the beginning again, because the last one really uh, didn't, didn't come through, basically. So um, can you very briefly just um, describe who you are, Jake, for the people that don't know you yet? Um, and uh, maybe just very briefly introduce the projects you're working with. So Grupo Punta Cana, Eco Red, and uh, maybe mention the documentary you've been working on as well. Sure. So, uh, so I'm Jake. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And um, I'm the vice president of the Grupo Punta Cana Foundation. Uh, if you know Grupo Punta Cana, it's like a tourism development company in the Eastern DR, one of the pioneers in tourism mm -hmm. here. And uh, essentially, my job is, you know, problem solving, finding solutions to different uh, challenges around the resort, whether it's garbage or uh, water or uh, restoring coral reefs, uh, developing local agriculture. And then we also work a lot in the local community, uh, in health, uh, education, uh, a lot of different interesting stuff with the, with the community. And then we work with a lot of um, international universities doing uh, research as well. Um, and then I'm the president of Echo Red. Echo Red is uh, an association close to 100 members, uh, all different sized companies um, and all different industries, not one inter industry in particular. Um, so it's, it's an interesting space to be in and learning a lot about uh, how sustainability happens in all different kinds of companies, whether it's an insurance company or it's a bank or tourism or a mining company. Um, I think there's, there's you know, uh, there's a value for sustainability in all of those types of companies. Um, and, then, uh, and then I also was the uh, producer and co-director of Death by a Thousand Cuts or Muerte por Mil Cortes. Um, and actually we had a little bit of news on Muerte por Mil Cortes. Uh, it was premiered in 2016, went to festivals for a number of different reasons. It's been a, a real challenge with distribution, but now it's, uh, the film can be seen, the English version on Amazon, Apple TV, and, uh, awesome. and a membership program called Topic. And then this week we'll be uh, promoting uh, through Instagram. Uh, we'll be putting the information out on Instagram and Facebook on how you can see the Spanish version for free. Uh, we'll be streaming awesome. it starting this month for, for Earth Day. It's a celebration of the whole month for uh, celebration of Earth Day. So I'll uh, have information. Hopefully we'll get that posted tonight. Just waiting on some, some 
some technical stuff. Awesome. That's awesome. And all of you that are watching, I highly recommend watching this documentary now that it's available. Um, Death by a Thousand Cuts or Muerte por Mil Cortes. Highly recommend it. It's super interesting about the charcoal problem here and related to deforestation at the border with Haiti and Dominican Republic. Um, so, Jake, let's dive into the topic of today, which is um, more specifically organic waste and, and worm composting. Um, yesterday, we had a conversation with Ginny, Ginny Heinsen, that does a lot of work. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of work with companies and, and also um, waste management and separating waste. And basically one thing that she observed is that almost 50 or 60% of all the waste they pick up is organic waste. So it's like this huge, um, you know, upper, well, both of, it's a problem because currently nothing is really being done with it, at least not at the local individual household level. It's all going straight to the, to the trash heap basically, right, where it turns into a problem because all this organic waste starts to, you know, like decomposing an anaerobic process, emitting tons of methane and you know, you know what. And so, um, yeah, so obviously there's a problem there, but there's also a solution and worm composting is obviously one of them. Could you, could you briefly explain a little bit, just an introduction, how, what's your take on worm composting and why, do you, why could it be such a useful solution to this organic waste problem? Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, the idea of organic waste uh, being the vast majority of the, the garbage that we produce. And there's a bunch of different tools to deal with that waste. Um, you know, personally, I think worms is, it's a very elegant solution. You know, you have these creatures that are willing to, you know, eat this food waste and transform it into really high value compost. So that's uh, a really interesting thing. They're doing this service for us, but it's not the only way to do it. There's lots of ways to transform organic material into all kinds of valuable uh, resources. So I think that's where it all starts. You know, I think the observation you mentioned that Ginny uh, brings up, this is kind of a, a passion of mine is you think about 100% of garbage. Um, right now, I would say, you know, in the public consciousness, most people think of that 100% of garbage, probably, you know, 80% of it is plastic. And in reality, uh, most of the, the municipal waste, most companies, most hotels in Punta Cana, most of the garbage that we produce, only about 10 to 12% of it is plastic. Uh, and right. that's not to diminish that problem. That is a big problem because if it ends up in rivers, if it ends up in uh, the ocean, it becomes a big issue. Um, but, you know, plastic is a smaller portion of a much bigger problem. So if you're going to really try and attack uh, the big issue with solid waste, you start with the organics because it's 50% 50 to 60 percent of municipal waste um, in kitchens and in restaurants and in hotels it's it's 50 to 60 percent um, and also it's a huge potential resource you know it's just it's right. a, an asset that we're not taking advantage of to turn into something really valuable uh, and the other thing is uh, the environmental impacts of uh, of organic waste when you're not treating it right are, are really high um, you know not only does it mix up with potentially recyclable materials and contaminate them with food waste and make them less valuable. Then you take it and you put it in a, a potentially in a dump or in a landfill uh, where it gets covered over and then it produces methane gas as you were mentioning. And that's a big contributor to, to, to cl climate change. Uh, in developing countries like the Dominican Republic, a lot of food waste, probably shockingly more than you would imagine, ends up at pig farms. Um, right. And that that can be a real health concern. You know, we're all locked in our homes right now because of a global pandemic of a disease that was of a virus that was transmitted from animals to humans, a zoonotic uh, a virus. Um, there's lots of examples of uh, pigs transmitting diseases to other pigs, which then right. lead to all kinds of health issues or also to people that consume those pigs. So. Um, you know, there's a big issue behind food waste. It's something we should really look at, and it's it's a huge uh, potential value for society to, to go after that. Yeah, I totally agree. And and before I dive into a little bit more, we can dive into a little bit more into, into what Punta Cana Group is doing with worm composting. Maybe it's interesting to explain just very ba at a basic level ba what what is vermicomposting, right? Because I think sure some of the viewers already know. But um, I think it's good to, to summarize it anyway. So just for the viewers that, that are not that familiar with worm composting, basically there's certain types of worms that eat organic waste. They occur naturally in nature. Often you can find them in your garden, if you have good soil at least, or on a farm or in the forest or wherever. 
And um, basically, they, they eat organic wastes and they turn them into compost, basically. It's literally their poop. It's worm poop, nothing more, nothing less. And so, in fact, they, there's two things they produce. They produce worm poop, which are the, they call castings, which is the it's compost. And then they also produce a liquid, um, which is also like a, a liquid fertilizer. So the beauty of this, as Jake points out, is like literally these worms, they don't eat anything. They just eat your organic waste and they eat almost all. There's, there's a few things that are not recommended, especially if you have a smaller scale kind of home set up or whatever. But they pretty much eat anything and um, they turn it completely into this beautiful resource. And it's not just any, any fertilizer. It's literally one of the best fertilizers you can get and it's biologically active it has microbial action it has like a nice balance of different nutrients so it's really an incredibly elegant solution that nature has come up with really and we're not taking advantage of it right and um and yeah, so some I, people I've always, so, I, I just yeah. decided to interrupt but I, I love the you know there's this whole idea of circular economy has become a big thing right now it's you know when we talk about developing a plastic bottle so that it can be turned into something from its initial design, you know, designing products and materials so that they don't become waste, so that they become something new and they're designed that way. They call that uh, cradle to cradle instead right. of going cradle to grave where you design something and then you just throw it away and it just goes right straight to end cycle. The idea is thinking about designing things so that uh, they can be reused. Well, nature kind of already invented that, <laughs> you know, like oh, that's yeah, what yeah. it's copying. So the whole yeah. idea of, uh, you know, composting, transforming uh, organic material into compost or worm compost or biogas, there's lots of things that's already been invented. Like nature kind of did this for us and we just need to do a better job of channeling the material and putting it into these processes where it can be easily turned into something. You know, I think that's what... Um, the challenges going forward. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in Punta Cana is really, you know, think of uh, what's the biggest part of our, our production of waste is organics. And then what can we do with it? How do we remove that from our waste flow and then turn it into something productive? And, you know, worms are just one way to do it. And it's, and, you know, I, I love the worms, uh, the idea of worm composting. And I, I started doing it actually before I came to Punta Cana. Uh, this was you know, 20 years ago. Um, I was in I was living in New York City, and uh, there was uh, an outfit called uh, the Lower East Side Ecology Center, and they were promoting worm bins that you would have in your apartment in New York City, which seems crazy. You know, everybody in New York City has these really tiny apartments, uh, including right. where I lived. And um, but they set you up in these boxes with worms in them, and uh, they sort of taught you how to manage it. And you know, I would take all my food waste and vegetable scraps and uh, coffee grinds and uh, eggshells. And I would just freeze it all uh, for like a week or two weeks. And then I would remove all that material and let it defrost. And then I would feed it to the worms underneath my sink, the kitchen sink. Right. Uh, so for like three years, I had a worm bin in New York City and I didn't produce a whole lot of organic material because I was basically feeding it to the worms. And so right. it, even in apartments, it's a viable solution. You gotta be on top of it. You don't wanna have, you know, Get it, let it get away from you and you get flies and stuff. But it's definitely a, a household solution. Um, it's also a, a, a good solution at a larger scale. It takes a little more management. But, um, but yeah, I think worms is, you know, I, I think it's just such a cool idea uh, to right. kind of have these animals working for you and they're living happily, but they're also producing something of really high value. Yeah, so there's a few things here that you mentioned um, and, and what you just outlined that I think are interesting for the viewers. So first of all, you mentioned cradle to cradle. I highly recommend any of the viewers to, to just Google cradle to cradle and you'll find out how there's a book written about it that really nicely summarizes this concept, which is all this is like one of the first kind of uh, trend setting books of the circular economy. Highly recommend it. Super, super interesting. So um cradle to cradle. Then you mentioned, um, you know, like how we are basically, you know, like circular thinking at the, at the household level in general and how, how we shouldn't produce waste. And there is no waste in nature. There's, there's no such thing. Everything has a function, right? And so obviously we can learn and, you know, we work a lot with permaculture and it's really one of the first principle of permaculture design is prolonged observation and just seeing what, what can we learn from nature? What are the patterns we see in nature, you know? And so, the smallest things like the leaves that fall from a tree you know we as humans think let's clean up the yard right and let's remove the leaves and it's literally the 
the only thing that we shouldn't do because the leaves, you know, they cover the soil, they, they protect the soil life, you know, because soil is a lot more than just dirt. There's like all sorts of microbial action, you know, and then it biodegrades. It has all these functions. And I think that's the beauty, like you say, with worms as well, you know, there's no such thing as waste. Um, and then you mentioned at the household level how you had a system. I think maybe before we go into the larger scale application at Punta Cana Group, like could you maybe ex share a little bit more of your experiences of how it was to have your worm bin? What, what did that setup kind of look like, if you would describe it to the viewers? And what were your experiences? Because, you know, we offer workshops, obviously, with Una Vaina Verde, you know, like how to make compost in home, um, como hacer abono en casa. We, we make a system. And one thing that people always ask, but don't the worms run away? Or, you know, they're always kind of freaked out. It's always this first moment when they go in with their hands and touch the worms. And it's kind of like, you know, ooh. Um, so what are your experiences? I mean, do these worms really crawl into your apartment all over the place? Or is that really not the case? Like, what was your experience? No, I mean, I mean, worms, you know, it is a live animal. You're doing animal husbandry. So it's like, you know, your dog if you don't walk your dog uh, and you don't feed your dog, it's going to be hungry and it might, you know, take a dump in the living room or whatever. So <laughs> you do have to take care of them. Um, but, you know, worms are like any animal. If you fulfill the requirements they have, you're probably not going to have a lot of problems. They're not going to want to get out of the habitat they're in. So if you have them, for example, in a bin um, and the temperature is right, the pH is right, they're getting food, it's not too humid. Uh, the food's not rotten, you know, they like fresh, fresh produce and fresh food, you know, they'll hang out and live there forever. And they just keep reproducing in that habitat. And, um, and they just, you know, continue to, to, to consume the waste and, you know, a healthy worm population can go on basically indefinitely, as long right. as you have like the right conditions, you know, but if it's too hot, if it's too wet, too moist, there's a lot of water in there, if there's, uh, or if it's too dry, or they're not liking the food, yeah, they they might try and get out. I mean, they probably won't be able to, but but you you know you want to keep think, you want to keep them happy. Right, exactly, and and that sounds like a lot, people, but honestly, it's really not that bad, you know. And so, just to give you an example, actually, I have one of our little worm bins that we produce during our workshops right here. So this is a simple, super small kind of demonstration system we have. You can see it's just a plastic box, and this is more to just illustrate the concept more than anything, right? I mean, there's only so much you can produce in this box. So the most basic level is just this box. And you can see Jake mentioned, so the worms basically need four basic things, right? They need to be able, they need to eat like we, they need air, like we do oxygen. They need water, but you know, as in moisture, they don't need, <laughs> need to be completely soaked. And, um, and that's, that's basically it. Am I forgetting one right here? Air, water, food, and yeah, shade. I mean, shade. They don't like heat so much, right? So yeah. because obviously normally they live in the soil and the soil shouldn't be exposed. So basically as long as you keep it in a, in a, in a, in a space that is not exposed to, to, to the sun or whatever in the shade, it's totally fine. We have this in our living room just as our own private kind of demonstration kit when people come. And so we just have this lid here. It has some holes in it. That's enough, you know. And as you can see, there are no worms to be seen here. There's a little spider here. That's about that. That's about it. <laughs> And so here we go, look at this. So actually right now they've eaten all of the organic waste. There's just a tiny bit of cabbage here and that's it. You, can, you can't even see the worms here right now. But let's see, look at this. The moment I dig in, there you go. There's some worms right there, people. There and go. so, you know, it's nice, kind of nice and moist here. It's not too dry. And uh, these guys are not going anywhere. You know, we have them in the living room. They're totally fine. You know, every now and then, like you say, I check that the soil is not too, the, the, the mixture is not too dry. If, if so, we spray a bit of water on it. And, you, and another important thing you mentioned is you don't want to overfeed them, right? If you overfeed them, they can't eat uh, as fast as the food is coming in, basically, and the food starts rotting. And that's when usually things start getting a bit gnarly, right? So right. you basically want to it's better to kind of start slow to kind of feed them just a little bit and see how fast this community of worms, you know, eat the food that we're giving them. And then once you see that it's like all kind of consumed, like right now, for example, these guys should be fed. And so, you know, the little demonstration, we've got a few, we had lunch here just now and like got a cucumber and whatever, stuff like this, they love it, you know, just like some old cilantro and like, you know, vegetable scraps and whatever, and that's it. You just toss it in there and, you know, put the lid back on and they'll eat that. And so, yeah, this is, uh, we got a question there uh, about the smell. You know, we, um, in Punta Cana, we, you know, I'll describe it in a little bit, but we have a, a much bigger system uh, that it's much more industrial scale. Uh, and people right. are always surprised when they visit that it doesn't smell. They kind of, 
expect it to be this kind of stinking mess. But the, the point of worms is you can't give them rotting material. They won't eat it. So you got to give it to them relatively fresh. That's um, right. And that's, you know, that's the point of it. Like you, you kind of feed them the material relatively fast. You know, these, these are fresh from today's lunch. So uh, it, it shouldn't smell. If it smells, the worms are probably not happy either. So, you, you know, you want to keep it right. pretty fresh and clean and they'll eat, they'll eat through the material before it really starts to get stinky. Exactly. And their castings, it literally smells like the, the like soil in the forest, you know, so it's, it doesn't smell at all. And um, yeah, it's wonderful. And also in terms of how much they eat, because people sometimes ask, you know, like, uh, you know, how, how much should I feed them? Um, yeah, I'm just checking some of the questions that were coming in. You know, how much do they eat? So more or less, I mean, the, the estimates, they vary a little bit. Also, it depends a bit on your population. Because, for example, in this box, you'll have grown-up worms, like live, like large worms, adults, and smaller ones and little ones. But on average, the, the amount, a, a colony of worms, can, they can eat, a worm can eat its own body weight or half of its own body weight per day, more or less. Some people say their whole body weight. I think that's a bit, um, bit optimistic. But let's say half their weight. So if you have, let's say half a pound of worms or like let's say you have a pound of worms and they have their body weight a day that means they're able to eat half a pound of your organic waste daily i mean that's that's a good amount right so and so then you know if you really would want to take the next step and kind of decide like how many worms would you need at the household level so basically what we recommend doing and this is actually um, for some of you that have seen the previous lives um, you know, we end every live with a with a with a reto with a challenge that we you know for people to do at home every day. And so today's live will actually be to start collecting your organic waste, separate, collect it for a week, and then kind of average it, you know, and kind of like kind of calculate how much if you cal if you if you save your organic waste for one week, let's say in a bucket, and then you weigh it and average divided by seven, then you have your average organic waste production per day let's say it's a pound, then you know you need about two pounds of worms to be able to eat that daily, more or less. It's a rough way to calculate it. Um, I saw in the questions that uh, some people were asking if they can buy worms of us. You can. We, we, um, we will sell it on, the, um, on our website, but for now you can send us a direct message. And um, well, now you know how to calculate more or less how many worms you need. And we sell them by pound, basically, you know, and then... Uh, so that's yeah, uh, that's I think another point is you know people have like a backyard or you know like for example we have a, a in our family you know we have um my wife kids and some people working in the house and stuff so you know it's not only worms there's other ways to do compost we can talk a little bit about too that are um you know a little simpler in terms of not having to manage animals and things like that but i mean worms is just a it's a great solution it's cool for kids too because they kind of see how this stuff works you know it's like this food turned into this beautiful black soil. Then you give it to a plant and you see this plant get really strong. You can, you know, grow tomatoes or grow whatever vegetables you want with the worm compost. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's just like good classroom learning for kids at home, you know, just to see how, you know, their food waste doesn't have to be food waste. It can be turned back into a plant. I think that's Absolutely. somebody said the uh, circular economy was invented by the government. It's kind of funny, but I mean, it might, the term, who knows, but like, the, the concept is what you do with it. And so I think the circular economy is a great concept. And I think the idea of Absolutely. cradle to cradle is a great concept. So, Absolutely. you know, it, if you turn it into that in your house, then, you know, who cares who invented it? <laughs> and so, Jake, so, so now that we've kind of gone into the household level, obviously you guys at a group of Punta Cana do this at a way larger scale. So how did that kind of start it? Like at the more kind of uh, corporate level, let's say, like how did you how did you guys, you know, learn about worm composting and kind of what, how did it start? And, and what are some of the main lessons you've learned? Because I'm sure that must have been a bit of a process for you guys as well, figuring out what works and Ooh. what didn't work. And <laughs> it's still a process. The, right. I, th I think the, I came down here uh, 15 years ago, 2005. Um, and, you know, the, one of the first things I started working on was waste because there's no good landfills in Punta Cana or the Dominican Republic, really. So all the garbage just goes to the dump. Uh, and that's a big problem. You know, you can, you know, in Punta Cana, we get all of our groundwater uh, from aquifers. We get that's where we get our drinking water. So, you know, if you're just dumping your waste into a hole and whatever like, leaks out or contaminates from that waste can contaminate your groundwater. So that's a pretty bad idea. Right. Um, in addition to all the other challenges with just sending, you know, uh, unsorted garbage to a landfill. 
And so, right. you know, looking at the problem, we said, well, let's go after the, the organic waste. And, you know, I had had experience with worm composting, but on a very small scale in New York City in my apartment. And I thought, well, yeah, why wouldn't this work in a bigger scale? So we, uh, we found a guy, uh, Don Rafael, who lived in uh, Via Maya, uh, and he was the largest worm comp Com worm, he was actually uh, in worm production and vermiculture, not worm composting. He produced compost, but as a byproduct, he was selling worms. Um, and, you know, there's farmers all over the Dominican Republic. If you're a goat farmer, if you're working in the mountains, if you're working in any kind of cacao, a lot of those places have little small areas where they do worm composting as well, because they have lots of leaf litter and they have lots of organic material. They feed it to the worms. They're usually in cool areas. Um, and then they'll, you know, use that soil. And so, you know, a lot of those places have them. So Don Rafael was producing huge quantities of worms in his backyard in Via Maya, uh, in these little like shacks that he had built. And it, I mean, you have never seen, I mean, worms that were like, you know, like this big, <laughs> like he was like these huge worms, it was unbelievable. So we met this guy and we went and visited with him and uh, he helped us design a system in Punta Cana uh in 2006 or 7 um, and they were just little containers um and basically it's been like a learning curve you know we basically just failed so many times <laughs> killed so many poor worms uh you know but basically like we fed them too much we fed them too little it got too hot it got too wet and the worms were just finally we got like the um you know the balance of this thing working and the worms producing right um, and at a, at a decent scale, and we were using kitchen waste, and we we're using waste from uh, from a ranch here, a horse ranch. Um, and then what happened is that you know we started doing trials with the material on the golf course, because you know the the real way to to pull off worm composting at a larger scale is to sell the material. You know, if you can find a market for this really high value material, then it's valuable and then it you know the material you're collecting from the kitchens has a value that you're being you're being able to sell so uh the golf courses said, sure we'll try it out um and what we learned was if you're just doing regular worm composting uh the temperature doesn't get very high so the worms uh will eat uh food waste like seeds from a like, tomato plant or an eggplant or whatever and it'll just pass through their system uh without actually uh you know killing the seed and so the, the material that we were producing still had live seeds in it, <laughs> which is uh, not ideal for a golf course. If you give a superintendent of a golf course, you know, this beautiful black soil, and in a week... It was growing on the green and stuff. <laughs> and plants on the fairway, actually. Uh, it was not popular. <laughs> I, I, he wanted to strangle me. Uh, Julio is our, our superintendent. He was completely unhappy about the, the eggplants. So... We had to go back to the drawing board and we found uh, a, a company, uh, you know, this giving you a little background of worm composting. It's not just a tiny little thing. There's a bunch of big companies doing this. Uh, we found Sonoma Valley worm composting out in California. And they work with the wine industry. So they take a lot of the grapes and a lot of the leftovers from, uh, from wine. And they had invented these systems they called uh, static aerated bins. Uh, and they're right. basically these bins that inject air uh, into the into the plastic box basically and that and you put the compost material in there or the organic waste and then um, the temperature goes up and that eliminates parasites and it eliminates the seeds and it also makes the material much softer and, and easier for the worms now you don't need this system in your house necessarily but if you're trying to produce large-scale worm compost for a golf course then then you need to pre-process the material Right. So they sold us a couple of these units, and then uh, we learned how to make, uh, you know, the pre-processing, the batch processing of the pre-compost, and then we copied their design and made a local version. Uh, and then uh, we had a university from California came out and started doing trials with us on the golf course. And uh, it was really interesting that we had the superintendents, basically, we'd lay out these grids, and some of the grids had our material, the compost, and some of it had what the golf course actually uses most of the time, which is uh, malorganite, which is like a you know a synthetic fertilizer. So they would compare the color of the grass and what they would rate it. You know, I like that one better. This one's better. 
And by the mm. end of the trials, the worm compost was, was better or and longer lasting generally than the material they were buying. Yeah, sure. So then, uh, so then they said, well, that's great. You know, you guys are producing a tiny amount of this really good material. Uh, can you produce enough for 45 greens and teas? <laughs> so just massive amounts of green area. <laughs> uh, so we went back to the drawing board and then we found another big company. Uh, and these guys are great. Uh, it's a company called Worm Power. And they're, they're up in Rochester, New York. Uh, and they've invented an industrial system that, that we ended up copying. But basically it's a, a metal bin. And theirs are 200 feet long. Uh, wow. And the, wor the box is elevated off the ground. And so the worms sit on the top of the box and it's about you know five or six feet uh, deep. So the worms just sit on the top and then the waste, the, their compost pushes towards the bottom and then you just harvest it from the bottom of the box. So you never have to separate the worms from the compost. They just sit on the top and the compost goes to the bottom. So it's like, yeah. uh, it's like a conveyor belt of, of compost. So we created Amazing. one that's uh, six feet wide by 40 feet long. So it's a lot of waste. We can produce like just in like two times a week, we uh, process, we, we harvest from the bin and we get about 175 to 100 pound bags of worm compost. Uh, that's a week. So we're, we're producing a lot. Right. Um, and then we bag it and then we sell it, you know, so but it's, a, it's a totally different scale than homes, but it can be done. You know, and, it, and it, I think it's, it's a super interesting model, um, you know, to, to try and incorporate worms into resorts and into golf course management. You know, I think that's, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, no, totally, it's, it's super interesting. Before I'm gonna ask you, the, I, I wanna ask you, what do you feel is like one of the main, what are some of the main challenges you perceive right now in terms of scaling this? Because it seems such an elegant solution, right? And what can we do to scale it? But before that, just let me answer very quickly two or three questions that showed up here. Um, one person asked here um, if it brings cockroaches. Well, um, in my experience, like with a small box like this, for example, no cockroaches whatsoever, no problem at all. Like um, as long as you don't overdo it with the food and you don't throw in stuff like meat and stuff like that and um, no, no cockroaches. We have another larger system here in the, in the garden. It's an old bathtub um, where we throw in more, like you know, a couple handfuls sometimes a day. Um, I've seen, you know, one or two cockroaches there sometimes outside, but honestly, it's never been like a huge problem, anything unusual. If the system is healthy, if, if, you're, if you don't overdo it and it's in balance, um, for me, it's never been a problem. I don't know at, your, at the household level, Jake, how your experience is when you had that bin under your sink, but it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be the case, right? No. No, and, it, and even for like flies, for example, if you have flies, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> you know, so right. Usually if you have cockroaches or you have... Uh, flies or you see some other creature in there that's not a worm or not some kind of you know small uh, bug or something you know burrowing in the soil you're, you're probably doing something wrong <laughs> so you exactly. know, review either how moist it is or how long you're letting the food sit in there or how much food you're giving but but typically exactly. you know if you've got a good eye on the thing it shouldn't have other other animals in there exactly and I, in my experience is we had um, one of our participants in one of the workshops that so they took one of these systems home and they're like, oh, we have so many flies. And often you can have like these little soldier flies, larvae and stuff like that. And what happens is first, usually you oh, they, they overfed the worms, like you said. And then one thing you can do when you have stuff that's a bit more like wet, let's say banana peel or stuff like that. One thing that helps, first of all, is chopping up the, the produce in smaller pieces, the worms will eat it way faster and break it down way faster when you chop it up. There's even people that have a separate blender for this. I mean, that's a little bit hardcore, but you know, just saying like stuff like, like pulp from, if you have a juicer, for example, the worms will love it. You know, it's like very easy for them to eat. Um, but another thing you can do for pieces that are bigger and a bit more wet, let's say is like to, to kind of cover them with a bit of soil to kind of bury them a little bit basically, because a lot of these little, um, the flies, they would lay their eggs kind of at the surface level of the soil, and so that would usually help. But if, if the system is healthy, like you say, it shouldn't produce flies or, or, or cockroaches. So with regards, by the way, to what the worms eat, maybe just also to quickly go into that. Um, I pointed out before, the worms, usually, they eat almost all organic waste, but it's recommended to um, avoid certain um, products. So for example, stuff that's acidic, citrus peels, fruit, um, peels of citrus fruits for small-scale systems at least. Usually you want to kind of take it easy on that. Um, eggshells, you can totally compost it, especially in the larger scale, but usually take it a little bit easy on that as well, initially in the beginning at least. 
Um, but we definitely do, don't compost the stuff like uh, dairy, meat, kind of protein-based stuff because it can really rot and that will attract plagues more likely. Um, but yeah, so usually what, what we use it for is really kitchen scraps. So anything like related to vegetables, herbs, um, fruit, fruit peels, fruit pulp, stuff like that. For that, it's really, really amazing, I think. Uh, and then one Don, other question. Don Rafael, yeah. he claims, uh, you know, he, <laughs> he was a little bit of an embellisher, a good storyteller, but he, uh, he had these beds that were huge, and he had these huge worms. And he claimed he dropped a full dead goat on one of his <laughs> compost piles once, and that it came back with just bones. So <laughs> supposedly you can, you can feed them you know, meat and stuff, but it's not recommended on a small scale. Don't do this at home, people. Don't do this yeah, at I'll home. Do Don Rafael, Don Rafael is crazy, crazy Theo. Yeah. <laughs> no. But it, it's true. It's like, it's like hot composting as well. You know, if you have a big pile and it's really hot, so now we're talking about a different <laughs> composting technique, which is hot composting. Um, you can, you can, like you say, you can, you can compost dead animals or roadkill or stuff like that. It will, it will decompose in no time. But again, Especially for beginners, for beginners, this is not recommended. Definitely not in a small scale worm system, and definitely not at home. You know, like unless you have like a lot of space, a big pile, and you know kind of how to manage it. But yeah, you can. In nature, everything will will decompose. Everything will eventually be given back to this to the earth, right? So, one last question here before we move on to the some of the challenges in in with group of Punta Cana and in the DR. Um, somebody's asking what's the ratio of soil to worms. Um, I'm not. I mean, really, in a, in normally in a, in a smaller scale worm composting setup and, and even in a larger one, you don't really use soil. Like literally, um, you have, when you set up the system, a smaller scale system at least, you have some bedding, which can be like old cardboard or paper or stuff like that, or some old worm compost. Um, and basically on top of that, you just start piling up the organic waste slowly but surely. So all they eat is the organic waste and that will be turned into um, into the to the compost. So there's really no soil in the sense that there's no dirt you know everything that's in there all of this in this box that i have here other than the food scraps all of this is compost this is not this is not soil this is not dirt this is all compost so this is all ready to be applied and um it's more moist it's active and yeah, uh, i think the, the question about how much how many worms i mean it just it basically depends on the size you know if you have a bigger bin and you're giving them enough food they'll reproduce and they'll fill that box so you right. Know, we started with a small amount of worms in, in our system, and we now have, you know, it's 60 feet long and six feet deep, so, or six feet wide. So, you know, and that started, we didn't fill that with worms to begin with. That just, they started populating it out, and the more food right. they have and the more space and the more comfortable they are, they'll fill that out with as, as many worms as they, as they want. This is, a very, this is a very good observation, too. I mean, we, we've noticed a few things here. This is why worm systems are such a beautiful illustration right of, of all these of the elegant solutions nature has come up with we already said in nature there's no waste circularity and so another really powerful concept in nature self-regulation right so worms worm populations will auto-regulate basically self-regulate so if you stop feeding them it's not like they all of a sudden will die off completely they will just stop reproducing and the community will kind of stay stable for a right. while and of course at one point you're going to have to start feeding them you know like because otherwise they may end up going looking for food, but they'll be basically chilling there for a while. So this is really quite beautiful. Like as long as there's enough space and there's food and the conditions are good, they'll keep reproducing, keep reproducing, they'll eat and they'll turn all this organic waste into abono basically in, in, in worm compost. And the moment there's a limiting factor, whether it's space or food or something else, they'll basically stop reproducing. So it's really a beautiful, beautiful system. So in that sense, really not, uh, not too complicated in terms of management. Um, let me quickly check the time. What time did we start, more or less? Like 5.40 or something, 5.35? Just We have an hour, so until then, uh, it's going to be cut off. Um, yeah, I would just add, I think also, you know, uh, sometimes there's, what I have in my house we, in uh, Punta Cana, and we have a small apartment in San Domingo, basically have, uh, you know, they're just, uh, uh, they're closed systems, they call them tumbler systems. Um, and it, it doesn't contain worms, uh, not everybody wants to, you know, you, you the worms, you kind of have, you, even when you go on vacation, you got to leave them enough food or have somebody giving them food. You know, you got to be kind of on top of the system. You know, you can't really just forget about the worms. It's kind of, you know, I say it's like having a dog, maybe not as uh, intensive as having a dog. You can kind of forget about them for a day or two, but um, you don't want to just leave them there forever. So uh, we had set up tumbler systems, which are a little simpler. It's basically like a, a big tank um, and then 
you put your waste in there and the same idea the food waste you put you know you want to have some dry material like leaves you want to have some soil you want to have food waste you want to have uh, you can have manure you can have you know whatever waste you can get your hands on um, and then the tumbler system is basically set up so you can easily just turn it over and it turns over and that mixes the material and gives it oxygen so um you know that's it's kind of like a, a simpler system it's closed so there's not a lot of uh you know creatures getting in there um and it's got a much higher capacity you know we generate in our house we don't need a ton of meat um and, and things like that so we're mostly generating a lot of you know vegetable peels and organic material uh from fruits and vegetables um and so that material you know it's great for a, a, a compost bin um, and you there's millions of models on youtube uh, and I think Vina Verde has a bunch of stuff they do with workshops that you can just figure out how to make this on a weekend with, you know, with like 25 bucks or even less uh, right. material uh, worth of worth of materials and build these systems. And it's and it's a super simple system. And there's one question I do want to give a plug. There's a, a question about which books um, to, to recommend. There's uh, this woman uh, who wrote a book, I think about 20, 20, 30 years ago, and it's like a cult following. It's called Worms Eat, Worms Ate My Garbage. Uh, and this woman, ha she's like a celebrity in, you know, she, she's basically like a best-selling author. And she wrote, she's like a librarian or something. And she wrote this tiny little volume, but like, it's very well known and it's super simple. Um, and, it, you know, it's not super technical, but it's just like, it's just like something to show your kids. You know, it's like this, it's like reading like a kid's book or something. It's super cool. It's right. called Worm, Worms Ate My Garbage. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's an image here. Boom, right there. That's it. Whoop. Yeah, there you go. I forget what, what's yeah. a woman, what's the person's name? I forget. I think it's a woman. Oh, sorry. Let me very quickly. I, I didn't know that particular title, actually. So let me very quickly check. One second. That is Mary Applehoff. Mary, M-A-R-Y, Applehoff. A-P-P-E-L-H-O-F. So yeah, we, we can we can put that up in uh, after after this live is over, we can we can put that in our story so people can see that resource and look it up. And so yeah, just since you did a little plug again, we did a little plug as well. Like so, all of this stuff that we're going over, we go over it in a lot more detail in the workshops we do at Una Vaina Verde. We have a workshop that's called how to how to make compost at home or como hacer abono um, en casa. Um, so in, in the, all our workshops basically are workshops that have a theoretical part. So you have a little bit of an understanding of the wider framework that all of this is taking place in. So we're talking about, you know, what are the nutrients that plants need, etc. And then we always have a practical part as well, in which we actually apply one of the techniques that you've learned about. So in this particular workshop, you guys actually learn how to make this bin and you take it home with a bunch of worms in it. So some people earlier on asked also if we sell worms, we do sell worms and we sell them by the pound. And um, we're actually right now going to be launching some of these workshops virtually because right now, obviously, we're dealing with the situation. And um, so we're just trying to adapt to that right now. And people, you know, they keep asking questions and showing interest. So very, very soon we'll be announcing some of the date, first dates in which we will do this workshop, how to make um, compost at home and some of our other workshops as well, Sustainability 101. And, um, and if you um, ever, if, if people want to, if they're in Punta Cana and, or want to come out and visit or have school groups or groups of people that want to come out and see kind of a larger scale operation, we do regular tours. You can just message us at Fundacion Grupo Punta Cana. Uh, that's our account on Instagram. Um, and you can check it out. But uh, lots of stuff to see there. We have beekeeping, worm composting. We do aquaponics. I saw Don Lechuga was here, but we do... Uh, aquaponics, um, which is growing fish and vegetables at the same time. Uh, we have like a local uh, 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 vegetable garden. Uh, we've got coral restoration work. So if you, if you want to come and do a tour um, of the stuff we're doing in Punta Cana and you're ever out or you want to come make a trip out of it, definitely, definitely write us and set it up. Yeah, awesome. I highly recommend it, guys. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on up there. Um, before we wrap it up from your side, just one or two more questions here. Um, Raquel is asking from Zero Plus, is, are mosquitoes normal in the worm system? Again, it, they really shouldn't be there. Mosquitoes normally would only breed if it's too wet. I mean, no, mosquitoes normally lay their eggs in water from what I understand. So yeah. um, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be in, in, in your worm system in large amount. Are you sure they're mosquitoes or can they be fruit flies? Because fruit flies are, they can, also they shouldn't occur, but they can occur sometimes. And, it's most likely due to the fact that there's too much food in there, too much wet food that's starting to rot already. 
Um, so if you if you add some of the wet materials, try and cover them a little bit. Um, Oops, sorry. Oh, no problem. Let's have a look at your kitchen or whatever. It looks looks very organized. <laughs> but, um, if, so, you have, if you have mosquitoes, they, they might be getting attracted to the worms because it might be moist or whatever, but they're probably being born somewhere else. So if you have, I don't know if these, if your system is outside, you might have like standing water in like a paint bucket or in a, you know, in a somewhere in like a lid or something like that. And they might just be being born in standing water somewhere or a little pond or somewhere that has water and then migrating over to the worms because they're finding, you know, the, the habitat or whatever. But generally speaking, if you don't have water, you're not going to, you shouldn't have too many, too many mosquitoes. Right. And the last question here, other than Juan making a comment that his last girlfriend called him a worm. <laughs> nice one, Juan. Um, it's Callum, Spirited Words. He's asking how quickly will one pound of worms turn into two pounds of worms? I don't know, in your experience, have you ever done tests, like in terms of the reproductive, re reproduction rate? I mean, it's always a little bit tricky, right? Because first you need to really weigh a clean amount of one pound or two pounds right. of clean worms. And let's say you would leave them in the bathtub or whatever system you have for a while, you would have to harvest mm -hmm. your entire system. You can do it. But um, I don't know, do you have an experience about that, how fast or? You know, we, we've, uh, you know, I mentioned we, we worked with these guys from Sonoma County uh, Worm Compost in California, and then we worked with Worm Power in Rochester, and we also worked with these group uh, in Mexico. Uh, it was a, an outfit, and they, these guys work with really big companies doing not just worm composting, they do large-scale aerobic composting as well. Um, and they work with the agave companies. So, the, you know, these companies that make tequila and they have huge amounts of organic waste come out of tequila production. And they've set up these systems for them. Um, and all three of these guys have the same criteria for <laughs> what a healthy system looks like. And it is not scientific at all. It's basically like if you reach your hands into the compost and pull it up and there's lots of worms, you're doing good. That's basically like the system. There's no real like measurement it's not like uh something you measure too often i've never heard of people really weighing worms i guess unless they're scientists uh and even the scientists we work with from uh, cal poly um that did the trials with us on the golf course they're they're basically that with the worms are you know if there's a decent amount of worms in one handful then you know you've got a pretty good uh, uh healthy population if the size of the worms you know if they're not all real tiny um then you know they, you know they don't do a lot of measurement you know of, of the worms you know too detailed yeah, and I guess another indicator could be like how much they eat, right, on a daily basis or weekly basis. Right. At one point, I'm sure you could see like, oh, we're actually producing more worm compost and more of our organic waste is being composted, being eaten. So that would be an indicator, I guess, of the system being, you know, being well and growing, you know, the, the population growing basically, right? So, right, right. Um, so before we wrap it up here, Jake, like what are some of the, the, the what's next for you? Um, any, any, what are the projects you're working on right now? And, and in terms of, Grupo Punta Cana and, and worm composting, et cetera. Anything else you want to share? What's in the pipeline? Yeah, well, we're, you know, we're, what we've been doing for the worm composting, you know, the product, st project started out as how do we capture as much organic waste as possible and then turn it into a valuable product that we could sell um, to kind of create the economic model for it. Um, and one thing about worm co compost at a large scale, um, it tends to be a little more expensive because it's more of a process than other types of compost. So in order to get, you know, greater volumes and really scale up and try and work with many more kitchens in the region, we're looking at other types of composting, like windrow composting, which is basically, you know, using a tractor with a turner on the side of it and in long rows just laid on the ground, turning the compost. Um, and our idea is to try and get as many kitchens locally as we can, you know, big kitchens, the you know, hotel kitchens, uh, the supermarket, you know, big, um, big kitchens that produce a lot of volume of waste and try and capture that and turn it into like a compost factory. And that the worm compost could be one component, which would be a much finer quality, higher quality compost, but then have, uh, you know, different levels of compost where, you know, the, the windrow compost doesn't have to be as high quality, but you're producing much more volume. So that's that's kind of where we're headed, and we've we've got a, a bunch of pilots we've already started doing. Uh, we've got a few grant proposals we're working on now to really try and ramp this up and include not just Grupo Punta Cana but other companies. You know, one of our challenges and our goals is always to try and use Punta Cana as a spot, you know, one site where we get these things started and show how it works, but then transferring it to other companies, other kitchens, other hotels, and really scale it up. 
Um, and I think, you know, if we can get to the point where we have a compost operation that's managing between 15 to 20 tons of organic material a day, that's Oof. 15 to 20 tons of material not going to the landfill. That's you know, huge volumes of methane gas not being produced. It's minimizing the risk of contaminating the, the aquifer out here in Punta Cana and also you know, creating a model that could be replicated in other places. So I think that's, that's kind of where we're headed. You know, we're still doing recycling. Um, and I, we think that you know, trying to involve other participants in this process, whether local communities or agricultural production um, uh, pig farmers in our region, you know, they're a big player, you know, they're kind of quiet because it's very informal, but a lot of food waste goes from formal kitchens at hotels and restaurants straight to pig farmers in, in our region, all over the DR, all over Latin America. Uh, you'd be surprised, even in the United States, a huge amount of food waste from kitchens ends up at pig farms, um, which, which sounds good, but there's a lot of risks in that. And so we mm -hmm. want to try and either improve that process or turn it into something else, but involve the pig farmers so it's not cutting them out of this market. Awesome. Super interesting. I also know you mentioned at one point, I'm not sure if this is public or not, but there we go. Um, you're working on a book, right, with some of your experiences. Is it something that's going to be published or what's, what's that about? Yeah, luckily this, uh, this quarantine has given me some time to really work on the manuscript <laughs> and find, right. finalize some editing. But yeah. Uh, I'm working, finalizing a book, hopefully this summer, um, called uh, Waking the Sleeping Giant. And the idea is basically how to take companies and turn them into um, much more effective uh, participants in sustainability. You know, companies often are just seen as either as the problem, you know, companies are the ones that cause the contamination or cause the, the problem in the first place, or we're seen as, um, you know, a source of funding where you know, they get hit up for money from foundations or people that want to try and solve the problems. But companies are, you know, f little uh, factories of innovation. You know, you've got a lot of really high powered minds in a lot of these companies and we're not applying it to sustainability solutions. And I think some of the things we've learned in Punta Cana is how you can do that, you know, without deviating the company from uh, from its goal of making money and satisfying stockholders but really producing good along the way. I think Punta Cana has a lot of really good examples of that. So the book will share those examples, other examples uh, in the DR and in internationally and give, you know, some of the experiences we've had, uh, you know, actually editing the chapter that has work on worm composting uh, in it. So, so hopefully, yeah, I'll be able to announce that. And just to put another plug in, um, if you check my Instagram this week, uh, we'll have the details on how you can see uh, Death by a Thousand Cuts, Muerte por Mil Cortes, in Spanish for free streaming uh, this week. Uh, so it'll be all of April. So stay tuned because we'll have more information on that. Amazing, guys. Awesome. So that's a nice resource that you should definitely take advantage of. Um, very, very last one, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. If you could share with the viewers one piece of practical advice, just one very practical suggestion or recommendation in terms of something they can do right now at home today, to manage their organic waste, what would you tell them? Like something they can do right now to start making a difference? Yeah, I think we, people are always shocked. You know, I have a lot of friends who are, you know, very passionate about recycling and about not, uh, you know, using plastic, um, but they, they minimize how, how much organic waste they produce. And I think, for example, if you just set aside a bucket and for one week separate all of the organic material you produce, the, the uh, pota potato rinds, uh, the fruit, leftover fruit, mangoes, seeds, uh, cuttings, everything that comes out of your kitchen that's organic that you're just going to put in the trash normally, just set that aside somewhere and then weigh it or even just try and figure out how much it is. And you'll be shocked at how much material it is. And you'll also be shocked at how clean everything else is, like your plastic bottles, your metal cans, your glass bottles, everything else you produce that's not organic waste, you'll see how clean it is, how easy and, and simple it is to manage, and how much better and easier it is to recycle it. So if you're able to just separate that organic waste, it's a really impactful exercise, I think. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a guy years ago who, who did an exercise where he basically carried around all the garbage that he produced in a day. Yeah. And it was just to give you the sense of how much garbage he produced and he had to carry it around. Well, in this case, you know, just separate your organics and really just be conscientious for one week how much you produce. I think it'll really be 
it really be surprising. You know, it's a lot. And if you add in what is in, you know, when you eat out outside of the house, when you go to a restaurant and you don't, you know, eat something that stays on the plate or you go to the supermarket and, you know, you drop two eggs on accident, and, you know, you start to add up all that organic waste. It's a lot. And people never really uh, realize <laughs> how much they produce. And if a, you have a family with a, a kid, two kids, yeah. three kids, exactly. there's five of you, there's a lady who comes in and cleans there, there's six of you, there may be a nanny involved, there's seven of you, you're producing a lot more organic waste than you think. And it's worth doing the exercise to, 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 to really measure it. And then, uh, and then you might be inspired to do something about it. Beautiful, man. I think that's an awesome way to wrap it up. A great call to action. And that was actually exactly what we were going to suggest to people to do as our reto, our challenge of today, which is exactly that. Collect your, separate your organic waste for a week. Collect it in a bucket or whatever container. You'll probably need a bucket. You may be surprised. Um, and, then, uh, and then weigh it and calculate your daily average just so you have an idea what is the amount of organic waste you produce per day. And then if you want to start working on it, this is the second thing you can do. You know, check out, like, go to our website, um, unavainavera.com, sign up for our, our newsletter. And so you'll be updated on, you know, when these workshops um, go virtual, because for now, of course, we have to work virtually. Um, so that's going to happen very, very soon. And for those that are interested, we'd love to have you there. And we'll teach more about different ways of composting, not just worm composting, but different techniques, including a few other ones that you can consider doing at home. And um, so go sign up for the newsletter, Tuna Vaina Verde. And then uh, in general, guys, just uh, spread the word about these live sessions. Every day we're going to be here at 5 p.m. with very interesting guests. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about Moringa with Ben Jam. Amazing guys. Well, amazing story. And uh, that's that. I'm going to wrap up here. I have 20 more seconds. So thank you all for listening. Thank